Thank you, uh, members. We are now moving on to questions to the Minister for Education, Mr Peter Weir. And the first person on my list is Mr Andy Allen. Speaker. Well, speaker, thank you, Member, for his question. Uh, my department does not hold information on pupils who are eligible for free school meals. It does, however, hold information on pupils who are entitled to free school meals. Maybe a bit of a slight subtle difference. Having applied to the Education Authority's free school meal entitlement process. This is collected annually via the school census. So the figures reach to the last five years. In 2016-17, 102,996 pupils were entitled to free school meals. In 2017-18, 101,061 pupils were entitled to free school meals. In 2018-19, 99,893 pupils were entitled to free school meals. In 2019-20, 97,350 pupils were entitled to uh, free school meals. In, and finally, in 2021, which is the last complete set of da uh, data, 98,239 pupils were entitled to free school meals. Mr. Allen. Well, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer? Minister, a um, significant number of children entitled to free school meals across our education system, and it's an important uh, mechanism for them, providing free school meals within the school setting. Um, Minister, you quickly moved during the pandemic to provide payments in the, when children weren't in school. Um, have you any plans to bring that forward in a more long-term policy in tackling uh, holiday hunger? As the member will be aware, I put a proposal to the executive. We reacted, I think, fairly quickly on the issue of um, particularly holiday hunger um, as it, it hit during the, the pandemic. Uh, and as such, I suppose one of the advantages that we have in Northern Ireland compared with um, other jurisdictions who operate largely through local government districts uh, is that from the point of view of a, a single payment that could be made um, virtually at the initially about 95 per cent or more uh, pupils who were entitled were, in, if you like, in the one set of pieces of information. We worked then to complete that in terms of, in terms of that. Uh, that was then put forward as a proposal to the executive as a whole to extend then the, uh, for, call it from a holiday hunger point of view, that during the periods in which schools uh, were not in place, i.e. summer, um, Christmas, Easter, and the half-term holidays, that there would be an extension until the end of the assembly term that those payments would continue to be made. To that extent, I think in Northern Ireland, we were the first jurisdiction across the UK, I think, to be able to do that. As part of that, I think there is, uh, and I take on board what the member has said, that that, if you like, provides a scenario for the next year or so. But as part of that, there are then discussions from the anti-poverty strategy, uh, the direct lead on holiday hunger, and indeed across the board in terms of child poverty lies with the Department for Communities. So we are working on a cross-jurisdictional basis, but particularly with the Department for Communities, to try to scope out uh, what actions could be taken then, which can then extend beyond 2022 to have a, a long-term permanent solution to the issue. Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I, can I just press the Minister for further clarity on that and, and ask the Education Minister if he supports the permanent introduction of free school meal direct payments during holiday periods? Yeah, I mean, I think that that would be. Uh, I'm entirely open to the avenue in which this can, can take place, but I would be supportive of that extending into the, the future and put on a sort of a permanent basis in that regard. As indicated, we have roughly about 100,000 at the moment now um, children who are entitled to, to free school meals. I think there is a concern that as we move at some point beyond the pandemic, and particularly whenever the issue of um, uh, you know whenever people are coming back into work, and we, we anticipate that, that as furlough ends, there may well be further redundancies that that number will expand. But I think it is important that that children are provided for during that that period. And in many ways, this has probably been an issue which has been forced into a, a stronger conclusion, possibly because of COVID. I mean, if there is occasionally the, the useful spin-off in that regard, it has focused minds. And as such, I think we do need to provide a, a longer-term uh, solution. That probably would mean um, a change in legislation, as the issue at, at present, uh, I suppose, is that, that, strictly speaking, it is uh, a methodology which is used in terms of those payments where we find sort of directions that, that can be done. They're not, strictly speaking, the free school meal side of things, but it, it, flows, it flows from that. 
Um, but as I said, we do have the, the high level of advantage now that we've worked, so therefore worked through with the EA and others to pretty much identify uh, particularly bank accounts and indeed uh, for any eligible family that this applies to, including actually arrangements with the Home Office in terms of refugee children, for example, um, where therefore we have a, a fairly watertight and fairly complete list of all those who can do that. Whereas I think some of, leaving aside the arguments elsewhere, if you're in England, Scotland and Wales, for instance, because that, that is done through a range of local authorities, they don't have the same levels of opportunities that, that are there. And I think we need to take advantage of the fact that those names are established through uh, the, the payment system that is there through the Education Authority. Ms Nicola Brogan. Dear Mayor, good last count, Carla. Um, Minister, the Department figures from last year showed that um, only 80% of children who are actually entitled to free school meals availed of the support. Can the Minister outline what he's doing um, to increase the number of children actually availing of the, the free school meal support? We would certainly encourage everybody to apply. It is about, in terms of the uh, proportionality, the latest figures are actually, um, yes, it is just Roughly speaking, I think the, the direct figures we're actually going to be releasing, given a headline today, it will actually be released on the 29th of, of April. Last year, we indicated it was around about 80 or 81 per cent where the proportion of, of school meals taken was that. Now, whenever we talk about school meals being taken, that's not simply that's on the basis on a day to day basis, and we've got to realise as well that there will be some pupils in any one particular time will be off um, on a period. So I think there's a level of, of encouragement of people to take up what levels of entitlement uh, are there. But ultimately, we can't force people to take uh, entitlement. But uh, I think certainly we'd encourage anyone who is eligible uh, to be able to, uh, to take that. Mr Jim Allister. Has the Minister any plans to visit the linkage causing disparity in general funding of schools, the linkage created by his predecessor of Sinn Féin between the number of free school meals in a school and the level of funding to which that school uh, is entitled to qualify, because that is causing great disadvantage to schools with a low level of uptake in respect of free school meals. Is that disparity going to continue? I'm going of the common funding formula, because obviously in terms of finance that is there, we need to make sure that it is directed always at the best possible um, and most advantageous ways of, of distributing that. Uh, against a backdrop, and I've striven to try to ensure as well that schools uh, have a higher proportion of the budget, that the aggregated schools budget is protected, and we need to ensure that whatever funding formula is there is one that is as fair as possible to schools. And I suppose in my experience, it tends to be, with any change to, to funding, uh, those who will gain an advantage from it. Uh, will be quite happy with it. Those who will uh, see a reduced level will have a level of, of disadvantage. But it's got to take account, I think, of all the factors. And I think from that point of view, I think the, the broader review that is there from common funding formula is to try to make sure that we have as a, a fairer distribution as possible. Ms Gemma Dolan. Okay, pre last concordia, Kester Verdo, question two. The member for a question. In making my decision on development proposal 584, uh, I was mindful of all the duties placed upon me and the need to consider all the evidence presented. Uh, I would point out as well that, that in many ways from a ministry or a departmental point of view when it comes to DPs, uh, that we are effectively I suppose, at the, the, the end point of the process. And proposals are, I can only make decisions on proposals that are brought forward by the school planning and managing authorities. So it's clear to me that on a number of grounds that the school at uh, St Mary's Ball, despite the great work of many people on the ground, was unsustainable and that uh, discontinuation is in the, the best interest of pupils. CCMS, which is the managing authority, has confirmed that due regard was given to the Rural Needs Act 2016 and details were included in the Equality and Human Rights screening uh, of DP582 in a separate Rural Needs Assessment. The Rural Needs Impact Assessment states quote, that the intention of the proposal is to advance the aspirations, aims and objectives of the sustainable schools policy. It is important that children in rural communities have access to quality education in cost-effective provision. CCMS uh, acknowledged in the screening of the proposal that the potential impact uh, of closing St Mary's Brawler uh, on the local rural community. And I think while it is recognised that the closure of any school 
is upsetting for a local community. Difficult decisions do have to be made, and they've got to be made actually in the best interest of the children rather than necessarily the institution. This decision allows these pupils to have access to a broad and balanced uh, based broad and balanced curriculum and is afforded that is afforded to other primary post primary pupils across Northern Ireland. Ms. Dolan. And I thank the Minister for his answer and I have a de declaration of interest as a past pupil of St Mary's. Um, Clarsha Columkill, Bally Shannon and Mayenia College in Mundorn are both closer to St Mary's Brala than any post-primary school in Fermanagh. I have raised this with the Donegal Education and Training Board and in a response to the Donegal ETB, the CCMS recognised that these schools may be schools that parents and children are wishing to consider and agreed to have the local locality education advisor liaise with the school's principal and Donegal ETB. Is this something you could also facilitate and support? Well, I'm happy to look into how it helps um, any individual pupil. I mean, I think from that point of view, there will be a number of pupils who live very close to border areas who, in either direction, may well be seeking uh, education outside of if they live in Northern Ireland into the Republic of Ireland or vice versa in that regard. So we'll be happy to uh, see what can be done to um, facilitate that. This is ultimately about trying to ensure that there is the, uh, the level of choice that is there for pupils. And we left, particularly as regards St Mary's Brawler, where in terms of the number of subjects that, that were able to be offered within St Mary's Brawler uh, was of a nature that was well below what the entitled frame, framework suggested. And also for those pupils who were attending, particularly in the examination years, in years 11 and 12, that 60% uh, of those pupils in last year had to travel to at least another school at some stage during the week uh, for their, to be able to avail of, of subject matter. So it is, I can appreciate, a painful case, uh, a painful situation where there is any school closing, but we actually need to ensure that the, the opportunities that are there for children in Brawla are the same as can be provided elsewhere. If that can be provided, by way of um, movement to a location which is in the Republic of Ireland in terms of some of those pupils. I'm sure that will be looked at uh, in terms of as happens in other occasions. Mr Daniel McCrossan. Thank you. Mr Principal, Deputy Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the answers to his question so far. Minister, uh, this is, uh, uh, as you've said, a very painful case that is uh, hitting very hard in the local community that it affects, and people uh, are very much uh, annoyed by it. Minister, can you give reassurance to this House that every possible avenue has been explored uh, to, uh, to save this school? And is this really the only option that's left, given the circumstances of this case? I think, uh, thank the member for his, his question. Look, let, let us put this in a little bit of context. Not only were the pupils of Brawler not able to access, by a long way, I think they were sitting on maybe 11 or 12 subjects at that, that level, the full range of, of topics. It was also the case, as indicated, that that uh, there were movement of 60% of the, the pupils at, uh, that, uh, at that level towards, towards other schools for at least part of the week. But also we were in a position in terms of St Mary's Brawler where those attending, I think at the time the decision was taken, there were 67 pupils in the post-primary. Now, whenever you take into account where the thresholds, the normal threshold for a post-primary school that uh, is regarded as a general rule of thumb as regards sustainability is that years 8 to 12 there should be 500 added. And I appreciate there will be circumstances where some schools are a bit below that. But whenever you are catering for a little bit over 10 per cent of what should be the minimum threshold, that is simply just not something that is sustainable. It, it is clear that down the years, because the issues of St Mary's Brawler has been one which has been on the agenda in terms of a range of options. For I suspect uh, most of the last decade, I remember um, one of his, I think one of the predecessors in Fermanagh South Rome, his party colleague Richie McPhillips, um, who had a range of suggestions which were all explored as well in terms of that. Uh, but there comes a point where in terms of being able to provide that level of, of, of education uh, for young people, that again, sometimes difficult decisions in terms of sustainability have to be met. But I can entirely understand the concern that will be there in any school whenever there is a potential uh, closure that has been, been mooted. Mr Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for his answers thus far. Minister, could you potentially outline the recognition which is given to reality when considering thresholds for sustainability of schools? Well, as indicated, I think in primary education, uh, I suppose there are principally two objectives in terms of the, the numbers that are there. Uh, from the point of view of, um, as I mentioned, about an intake of 100, 
um, an overall cadre of, of 500, um, and also the impact that it has on the entitlement framework, because it's about the, the level of choice. There is, I think, very specifically within the primary sector, much more of a clear differentiation, so that within a primary school, within what is counted as an urban setting, um, it is 100 and, uh, 140 is the recommended minimum threshold number. Within a primary school, within a rural area, it's 105. So there is perhaps that more direct relationship, um, because obviously, particularly for primary schools, there is an expectation that uh, for children to have to travel long distances is, is more problematical for very young children than it is for post-primary level. But even if we take those figures, uh, we are in a situation where, in terms of St Mary's Brawla, uh, that the numbers attending and had been attending for a number of years, um, and it is a scattered rural community, so it, it, it is not, to be fair, that there was some vast pool of, of, of untapped numbers of, of children. But the numbers attending at a post-primary school in a rural setting were less than two-thirds of the minimum for a primary school within a, a rural setting. So, again, I think that really becomes uh, unsustainable. It is the case that in terms of rural needs, it is one of the factors which is taken into account. Uh, and I can appreciate there's probably within an urban setting a little bit more of fluidity. And I would also indicate as well um, that uh, last year there was an amendment, largely speaking, made to what definition of rural and urban was. Um, there was a, an old definition within education uh, of uh, urban being purely Belfast and Londonderry. It's now been extended to actually cover, uh, to deal with some of the anomalies where there are large areas of, of, of population, large settings. But even with that, whatever way you count it, and you count it on a rural basis, unfortunately, St Mary's Brother simply just wasn't meeting the criteria on a range of, a range of subjects. Mr Alex Easton. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, question number three. Uh, so, when a, an EA property becomes vacant, it may be put to alternative use, retained for a future educational uh, use, or disposed in line, of, uh, in line with current guidance from land and property services. It's normally where disposal takes place, then there is a, a sort of a pecking order where there, an option is, first of all, seen whether there is any other. Um, educational benefit that can be used, um, it would then be offered either on the basis of uh, social enterprise or community group or other government department, and finally then, if there is no interest in that point of view, to a commercial setting. Specifically, the former uh, Cotton Primary School near Newton Ards is being retained uh, by the Education Authority for potential use by children and young people's services for special educational purposes. Uh, it is under consideration for additional special school provision, and the review in terms of its uses is ongoing. Mr. Easton, I um, thank the minister for his answer so far. Can the minister outline the same pressures that have warranted the building being considered for use, and could he also give a guarantee that he could secure the site as the place has been wrecked? <laughs> well, certainly, I think on, I suppose on maybe take the first point first. So there's a significant additional placements are required for September 2021 for children and young people with statements of special educational needs in special schools. I think there is a virtuous situation where also I think it's, it's also the case that special provision in mainstream schools. And I think down the years we've seen an expansion both because of additional statementing, but also children who maybe if we go back 10, 20, 30 years would not have been in a position to go to school are actually much more able to do that. So. As I said, uh, that has arisen, I think, also from a combination of the EA clearing a substantial backlog of statutory assessments. There was a period where there was an extremely long waiting list. That has been largely uh, got down. And also there is uh, a yearly trend of increasing numbers of children and young people with SEN with more complex need. There's been a 5% increase, for instance, on last year. So my officials are working with the EA through a number uh, of fora to undertake a full assessment of capacity and need with the special school estate uh, and specialist provision within mainstream. In terms of any physical destruction to the building, obviously we've got to make sure that anything is fit for purpose. So I will raise that with officials to see what actions are getting taken to try to secure the site to make sure that and there's always the risk with any level of vacant sites that it is secure that, that uh, that it is not, as much as possible, subject to any level of vandalism as we move ahead. Ms Rachel Woods. 
Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers so far. And on, on the same thread of site disposal, can I ask the Minister for any update he has on future plans for Priory Integrated College site, which is currently in Hollywood, uh, if and when the school should move to Redburn Road? In terms of that, I will um, specifically I will get the information for the member in terms of the detail of that and, and write to her um, on that. Clearly, as part of the overall, um, as Priory is one of those projects which has been green-lighted in terms of fresh start money. Therefore, there the will be, uh, in terms of the um, change of location, which can hopefully then allow Priory to, to further grow and flourish. Um, it would require then that relocation side of things, but I will check up the details of the, the timing. As indicated, I think the general position, uh, because it would fall under the, the remit of the EA, uh, is that there will be initial retention and then an examination if the site is to be disposed of in any way. Again, there is that consistent pecking order that where there is an expression of interest that is uh, doable from that point of view, uh, which has a, a direct educational impact, that will always come as, as first priority then either sort of any government institution or um, a situation involving a social enterprise will come next. It's only when there isn't really any uh, interest from those that, that there will be examination of a level of commercial disposal um, for whatever purposes are, are put in place there. Mr. Alan Chambers. Uh, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, uh, Minister, I certainly welcome the proposed use uh, of these premises, but. Uh, can you give me a time scale of when you would anticipate uh, these premises coming back into meaningful use? Well, I think from that point of view, um, it will be dependent upon. Uh, there is currently an exercise going on, as we, we see, because of some of the additional pressures that will be there in SEN in September 2021, and those can't simply be met by putting more children in classes. In part because there will be a restriction, particularly with SEN, in terms of special schools of how many you can accommodate within a class. There's, there's probably uh, less elasticity, shall we say, than there would be within simply a mainstream setting. Uh, as such, I think there's a strategic discussion on precisely then if there's additional physical resources being needed, additional sites being needed, whether that will be met in the short term by way of using vacant sites that are present, or to what extent, for example, additional mobile classrooms in some settings can be done. So it will be part of an overall strategic decision. Uh, therefore, I think very particularly from the point of view of September 2021, there'll be decisions will be taken fairly swiftly to try to ensure then that, that what we have the way of a school estate is compatible with the, the needs and pressures. So I would anticipate from that point of view um, that decisions will be taken fairly shortly. What I would indicate as well, that given the ongoing pressures that are there um, and the need, if we look from a longer term capital turnaround in terms of special schools, uh, if there was a conclusion reached that, for instance, the cotton site was not needed for September 2021, it doesn't necessarily mean that that is ruled out for that purpose for all time. It may well be that there is a pressure, for instance, in 2022, which needs to be met, and that will be factored in. Hopefully, uh, there will be a bit more clarity around that very soon. Ms. Carol McKillen. Mr. Cahar, question number four, please. Thank you, number four, her question. In delivering the statutory duty on my department, which is to encourage and facilitate the development of Irish medium education, a range of actions, funding support and policy adaptations are undertaken. My department seeks to respond positively to parental demand for Irish medium provision and works to meet the needs of the sector, for example, in considering home to school transport requirements and school requests for temporary variations to their approved numbers. All policy areas across the department consider whether any policy adaptation could support the delivery of that statutory duty. Additionally, a range of bespoke uh, sector-specific investment is provided to support the development of Irish medium education. This includes annual funding to CNG, which acts as a valuable advocate for the sector, specific support for to Irish medium units, uh, funding to the Education Authority and CCEA, and early years uh, funding to Altram which has developed a range of preschool resources aimed at helping uh, immersion learning. My department also requires its arm's length bodies to support the delivery of this statutory duty and to report back on actions taken during the uh, business year. A shared education and sectoral support team has been established within the Education Authority and works with Synergy to support schools. At the beginning of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, I set up the Continuity of Learning programme with a focus to support pupil uh, learning. 
Recognising the specific needs of the sector, I included a separate work stream for Irish medium education. Uh, much valuable work has come out of this work stream. I am also aware about the loss of language learning due to the pandemic and shortage of substitute teachers, so my officials continue to work with relevant partner bodies to seek opportunities to mitigate and resolve such concerns. Ms. Nicolum. So, given your comprehensive response, perhaps could you outline any discussions you've had with your ministerial colleague in the Department for the Economy regarding workforce planning for the Irish medium sector? Well, in terms of uh, workforce planning, obviously as part of that, and I suppose very specifically if we're looking at uh, the issue of qualified teachers, there's obviously a particular issue at post-primary. So I'm aware of the um, qualification uh, of the issues about availability of suitably qualified teachers. So I engaged last December to ask officials to have additional flexibility for Irish medium schools so that they could utilise alternative staff, for instance, under the Engage programme. And the aim would also to be, as we move ahead this year, in terms of that, um, if they are unable to secure qualified teachers. It is also an issue that I have uh, raised with my ministerial colleague at the Department uh, for the Economy in relation to initial teacher education. As the member is aware, there is an interface between education and economy on that. Um, so my officials will be engaging in work uh, to consider the current provision, particularly for post-primary, with ITE providers and sectoral representatives. This work will scope what longer-term ITE provision is needed to ensure beginning teachers, because clearly, even if there is agreement today on something, that will only take effect in four or five years down the line. Um, and how those teachers could receive the best training to support in delivering immersion education within the Irish medium sector. Uh, there is also the issue, I suppose, where my officials continue to work in terms of accessing substitute teachers. There have been opportunities at times to then uh, take, um, I suppose, those with either sort of expertise from outside the sector and provide um, training, language training for those, uh, but also then to apply a level of flexibility. I think it is also important. Because I think one of the things that, that I think maybe the pandemic has exposed, we probably pride ourselves on a large pool of substitute teachers. We find at times that has maybe been um, not quite as deep in terms of numbers as, as we thought. I think there is importance as we move ahead in terms of the substitute list, in terms of GTC, that there is a much more greater level of accommodation for those, for instance, from outside this jurisdiction who may well want, whether it is in the Irish medium sector or more generally. Minister, you are at your two-minute limit. Okay. But you can resume your answer with after Mr Patsy McGlone asks his question. Mr McGlone. Uh, thanks very much, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his, his comprehensive answer. I was listening very carefully there to what the Minister said, particularly about uh, the uh, pupils who had um, lost out on the immersive learning in the, the Irish language sector. And he, he did make uh, reference to that they were looking at mitigating measures that could be taken uh, to try and help those youngsters catch up with, with time lost and learning lost. It, it would be helpful if the Minister could provide us with details, well, now or right to, to me, with some more expansive detail on that, please. Part of it is about adaptation of resources that, that are going to be provided to the sector, indeed across all schools in the sector as a whole. So this year, which was a little bit, had a little bit of interruptions to it, we uh, moved ahead with the Engage programme. To some extent, it was a level of disruption to engage during the spring term from January through to April because schools were not physically there. But uh, we've been able to roll over funding, first of all, for the rest of the academic year. Uh, the aim, and I think there's been indicative support in terms of COVID funding for this for 21 22, to roll that forward into the next academic year, uh, yet to get sort of a final paper just signed off by the executive. But part of the aim of that is to provide schools with levels of funding to help with that level of catch-up. And I would always take a view that it is not really for either me or the department to try to dictate from on high exactly how that should be spent. And so, for example, the flexibility is largely given to schools on the ground with their allocation of money to be able to spend that for their levels of intervention that they want to put in place. Uh, and as such, for instance, in the Irish medium sector, there is that, therefore that flexibility that if they want to particularly focus that in on lost language learning, that could be one area where they could uh, progress that. Similarly, I think, and we're waiting for a final, um, again, there will be a paper put in, but there's been indicative allocations within COVID. Over the summer, as well as what is happening, broadly speaking, within youth work, 
the intention would also be to enable schools on a voluntary basis to be funded for one, two or three weeks, depending on what they want to do, of a, like a summer school of, of learning. And again, that will give opportunities, given, I suppose, some of the pressures that will be there, there will be many schools who will simply say, Look, we feel it's better for our pupils and ourselves to have a bit of time off over the summer period, and that's perfectly understandable. But there will be those opportunities as well, which again, the level of, of flexibility will be able to be applied by schools to be able to, to narrow in and focus in on the pupils that they want and on the level of um, provision that, the, that they want. So I think there will be opportunities that will be provided. That concludes the period of time for listed questions. We now move on to topical questions. And the member number one on my list is Ms Claire Sugden. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I think the First Minister spoke to this earlier, but would the Minister provide details on which Sure Start can resume activities due to restriction easements? As part of this, uh, we put forward, um, obviously we're trying to balance out the, the very important provisions that are made by Sure Start, by generic youth, for instance, uh, with obviously making sure that they're compatible with public health requirements. As such, while and I think it's probably the case that the focus tends to be on the youth side of it. There was a paper put to the executive on the restart of those facilities, which was passed um, uh, before Easter, and the green light has been given to Sure Start. So, uh, for all Sure Starts, uh, all child centred activities, which is the bulk of what Sure Start will do, has been given a green light to fully um, restart. Obviously, uh, those Sure Starts will try and operate where they can within mitigations and, and protections. I suppose the one area which at present is still outstanding in terms of Sure Start, sure Start as well, will also provide, as part of its programmes, we we'll look, for instance, how, what level of engagements it has with, with adults and with parents, as yet from the public health point of view, because that is where there is a greater level of risk, as opposed to very, very young children. Um, as such, uh, there has not been directly a green light been able to be given to those, so it is about a phased restart. But it, it has been agreed by the executive for a full restart in terms of all child centred activities. And, and it's important, particularly given that Sure Start is, is largely focused in on areas with, with um, higher levels of social deprivation, that uh, the, the damage that was being done unfortunately had to be done uh, because of actually some of the provisions that were, had to be put in place. We're starting at least to reverse those. Ms. Sultan. Uh, thank you for the answer, uh, your answer, Minister, that that was going to be my follow-up. Will this include families? Because I think you rightly point out that that provision is what has been missing, and, and certainly um, in correspondence that I have received, um, it's, it's, being, it's affecting our communities. So can we expect a time frame of when we can get to that next phase so that families can be included, even on an outside basis? Can we meet in groups with families face-to-face -face outside? Point of view, we will keep, continue to be pushing in relation to it. Obviously, the concern that would be there from a public health point of view, and it is a question of getting support from the Department of, of Health, I, I will not certainly be any sort of barrier to that, will be whether it's within schools or within Sure Start, or else, but particularly whenever you've got very, very young children, there is very little risk that is there from the point of view of transmittability. Um, and as well as that, the value of the intervention probably outweighs any level of the risk. Where we find, I suppose, within schools or indeed within Sure Start, the bigger dangers are adult-to-adult -adult transmission, so that would be a slightly higher hurdle to, to overcome. But certainly, as, as we move towards gradually easing of restrictions, I believe that that will come. I don't have a definitive date for that at this stage. Mrs. Sinead McLaughlin. And thank you, Mr. Principal Speaker. Minister, um, can you confirm whether the AS grades awarded in 2021 um, academic year will count for next year's A-level grades? Thank you for the question. And obviously, as, as the members are aware, the, what was previously awarded in 2020 does not count towards 2021. In terms of a wider picture, in terms of the exact structure of examination grades in 2022, I hope to be in a position to make an announcement in the next few weeks. I'm not, I, I, at that stage, because we are still working with CCEA, uh, we work closely with, with particularly with stakeholders within the schools, so I would anticipate that we would reach a final position in the next few weeks. So, uh, from that point of view, I'm not really in a position to unpick that announcement at that, that stage and give specifics on individual elements of that. But I hope to we will make that clear within the matter of the next few weeks. Mrs. McLaughlin. Thank you very much for your answer. Uh, and Minister, you'll um, appreciate the sooner that 
decision um, is made, the better for, for our students. Mr. GCSE uh, students have reported a significant increase in the number of assessments and the exams um, that they are facing. Uh, would you agree with me that um, they, they, this is adding huge pressure on, on students that are already feeling uh, the, the pressure of this pandemic on their mental health and will um, support for these students being given, be given in school on a daily basis uh, to help support them? Part of it, I suppose to disaggregate that into a couple of questions, um, what has happened in terms of assessments is, first of all, uh, that provision has is, is been made available for assessments. However, uh, the concept, I think, in relation to qualifications um, is that these are to be evaluated by the school, that assessments themselves, first of all, are not compulsory, so they can use any evidence during the, the period in question. But also, I think the advice that has been given, for example, not simply through the Department of Education, but through CCEA, uh, and I think we should also appreciate that not every examination and not every qualification is through CCEA in Northern Ireland. Uh, is that where it's being used it should perhaps be on the basis of um, a maximum really of, of one per subject matter. And there are some schools who've gone well beyond that. And schools have got the autonomy and if they are being asked largely to provide um, their own information and assessment on evaluating uh, theirs. There are some who've gone further than what has been suggested and others have felt that there wasn't a, great, there wasn't a particular need uh, for that. So uh, I can appreciate the, the level of pressure that is there. As part of the overall structures that we're looking at um, from a financing point of view uh, during the next year, there will be additional money that will be made available to support people's emotional health and well-being. And that, again, there will be opportunities from within schools to be able to deliver that. Mr. Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And I have to apologise to you for the last, um, for the executive office. It was down for number eight for tropical, but for some strange reason, I felt like Lifford Christie running up and down this building. I tend to be late for it. The house seemed to move a bit quicker than I did, but that's my apology anyhow. Um, minister, thank you. Uh, can the Minister provide a justification as to why 11 of the 39 recommendations of the Independent Review of Integrated Education will not be taken forward? Please. The specifics of that, in terms of a range of some of the... Uh, the the process is being currently – there are some, if you like, which can be taken forward and brought into place. There are some individual ones which um, – and even in terms of prioritisation, some of the authors of that – and again, if there's discussions with the sectoral bodies, they will say, well, actually, that's less of a priority, it may be less of, a, of an issue. And there's a range within that uh, of uh, some wider recommendations which fall into the category of really should be looked at. It's part of the wider picture of the independent review of education. Um, it is the position in terms of that independent review that the call has gone out um, and indeed closed on, I think it was the 26th of March, for those who wish to put their names forward as potential uh, members of that panel. There was a significant response to that. And that is now going through a process where uh, there is both sifting going on and indeed then a panel will interview those to see who is appointable within that. Um, but it is always the case that, that there is an interconnection between most aspects of education and consequently there are a range of recommendations uh, that uh, best fall within, uh, within that panel. I suspect, because we are talking about 39 recommendations, if, if the member wants to write me with specific recommendations that he feels are not being taken forward and the rationale behind those rather than try to individually sort of extrapolate into those on the, the floor. I would say as well, I mean, I don't know whether maybe the Speaker at the end of this will, the member will have to remain behind and write, I will not be late for the Assembly 100 times as a sort of form of, of sanction. Those, those tropical questions can be, can be difficult. Uh, Mr. Cantney. Thanks very much. There's a hundred lines. I'll have to go back to the annals of history when that happened. But, um, Minister, thanks very much. That was a very comprehensive education, and I will indeed come back to you with those concerns that some within that sector feel. But I was wondering, Minister, to implement and assist the growth of that integration sector, can you reassure us of the Department's commitment to that sector? Please. It is, I mean, but I'm also I'm committed to that sector and committed to every sector because I think it's important that every child is, is looked after. As such, there will be a range of decisions. And so, for example, uh, today I've signed off on 
the transformation of one of the uh, schools within East Antrim uh, to move towards integrated status. Um, and, you know, and so, therefore, uh, we will sort of try and support all pupils uh, through that. Ms. Nicola Broga. Um, the Children and Young People's Commissioner has recommended that relationship and sexuality education should become a mandatory part of the school curriculum. Can the Minister outline if he plans to um, implement such recommendations? That would require, I think, a change in legislation. I suspect this will be difficulty uh, leaving anything else aside. That something that could happen overnight. The experience, actually, internationally within any subject, is whenever it's made mandatory within the curriculum, there's no real causal link between that being better taught uh, than than others within that. Now, what I'm working on within RSE, there is a requirement for all schools to deliver RSE. Uh, and also, it is critical that we look at where minimum standards are. And so, consequently, particularly in light of the Gillen report, uh, my officials and DOJ officials are working on a range of issues to see where minimum content should be. And that's particularly focused in on issues such as domestic abuse, uh, such as um, the issue of consent. And I think those, those are critical. I think there's always a note of caution between making various elements compulsory, because it can therefore sometimes crowd out other elements of the, of the curriculum uh, as well. I think Northern Ireland overall has benefited from having a level of, of flexibility within what can be delivered. And that means actually it can sometimes respond to changing events, changing necessities in that, in that regard. And I think that that overall is an advantage of our system, as opposed to, uh, again, some other jurisdictions where there's an attempt simply to impose from the top down. Ms. Brogan. I thank the Minister for his answer, and he's actually touched upon um, my follow-up question. Um, this Assembly has already debated um, the domestic abuse and um, sexual abuse on women and girls. Um, so, can you, Do you agree with me, Minister, that um, mandatory and standardised relationship and, relationship and sexuality education will actually help educate um, our girls and boys and better equip them, uh, leading them into adulthood? I think, uh, I think there is benefit through, across the board, that level of flexible approach to the curriculum. However, as indicated, particularly as regards to the Gillen recommendations, uh, myself and Minister Long met, um, I suppose, roughly about a month or so ago, we started the train of work of the two departments working close together on those recommendations, most of which fall to DOJ, but obviously there is a level of overlap with, with education. And as such, I think RSE um, is a requirement for all schools. Uh, as part of that, it is not simply a one-size-fits-all because, depending upon age and experience, uh, there can be a, a level of differentiation. But it is important that we look at where we see areas of minimum content, and particularly uh, if we can ensure that, that society reflects uh, the very proper concerns that are there in terms of uh, issues around abuse, which lie beyond simply what is happening within the classroom, but can then transmit quite often, unfortunately, generation to generation within families, uh, and issues around a proper understanding and acceptance of the idea of consent. I think that is, that is critical as we move ahead. Uh, Mr Stuart Dixon isn't in his place. Mr Alex Easton. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister, could he confirm that the very successful Engage programme will continue for the rest of the term? Well, it, it is the case, yes. I mean, uh, we're waiting, I think, to get final confirmation beyond that. But the rollout of the Engage programme, which would equate, I think, to roughly about five and a half million uh, for this term, there's indications that that will continue on for the rest of the, the term. And we're looking as part of that to finalise the details as we move into um, the school year of 21 22 and what happens uh, over the summer. It is important, as indicated earlier, that it does give that opportunity to schools to be able to tailor what, what they are getting, um, to try to make sure that it can be focused in as much as possible on um, where they see the best interventions, and that is quite often best decided at that grassroots level. Mr Easton. Yeah, I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Does the Department have the necessary budget to continue this programme into the next academic year? That would certainly be the aim. As part of that, because it's a one-off costing, it's not something which is directly baseline within the budget. But uh, prior to the conclusion of the budget exercise uh, in March, 
departments um, were asked to put in their bids for the pot of COVID money. As such, it has been agreed provisionally uh, that money can be made available for a continuation of the Engage programme through COVID uh, to run certainly from September onwards. And similarly, as indicated earlier, the aim would also be to um, be able to have a level of, of academic intervention as well as other in interventions in terms of youth side of it during the summer, during the summer as well. Um, so certainly the aim would be to do that. In terms of the exact details of the proposals, there may well have to be a further paper brought fairly shortly to the executive simply to confirm that. But broadly speaking, the, the level of support has been indicated from the Department of Finance and the executive as a whole for that to continue during 2021-22. Thank you. That concludes question time to the Minister for Education. If members would take their ease for a few moments. We will return to the item of business that the House was considering before question time started. If members would just take their ease for a few moments. Thank you.